Hey everyone, thank you Benny for the, for the introduction. Um, so I'm going to actually give a survey, um, a quick overview of what it means uh, for the cryptography and for the machine learning parts uh, to kind of try to bring these two worlds uh, together. Uh, just see if can... All right, so the first question is, as always, is why? Why is this interesting to look at privacy-preserving machine learning? And one way of framing that is to uh, look at what a typical machine learning process might look like. So this is coming from a company, for instance, that would like to build the service that they can offer to, to clients and so on. So what they would typically do is they would start out with a data set. At some point, they would run that data set through a training process, and they would end up with a model that they can offer as, as a prediction service to potential cli uh, clients. But of course, that typically exists in a context as well. So and one of that is, how do you get the training data? It could be data that they collect, but it could also be external data. So they might go to public data sources like ImageNet. They might go to uh, experts or specialists that gather this data set over years of, of practice. Or they could even go to companies that are interested in selling the data set um, in exchange for, yeah, for as, a, as a price. And on the other hand, there's also when they have the service, it could again be for internal purposes, but it could also be that they want to offer this to clients, to customers uh, outside of the company. So if you have this process, then uh, as a concrete example for this, uh, you could have this uh, skin cancer image classification example that was presented about two years ago by a group of researchers. What they did is they developed an app for uh, taking photos of skin lesions, and then they could run this photo through um, a convolutional neural network in order to detect whether or not you should go see a dermatologist for further inspection. The way they built this system was they went to a dermatologist, they collected all these clinical photos, they ran it through a transfer learning process to end up with this CNN. Um, and they actually, uh, based on this, they managed to reach uh, roughly expert level performance on these predictions. So it had a, a huge impact because now everyone could potentially have an expert dermatologist in their pocket on the mobile phone uh, and have their skin lesions analyzed whenever they wanted to. So at the fear of stating the obvious, when we start to analyze this sensitive data and start building machine learning systems around this sensitive data, we could potentially move into to, uh, many interesting areas where uh, that would have great benefits. However, of course, there's also a problem with this. And one way of phrasing this uh, privacy problem is, could be through potential bottlenecks. And I'll try to identify some of those. So the first one is, you need to get access to this training data. These dermatologists, when you get the data from them, for instance, they could face liability on the data set and would actually not risk giving it away because of this reason. It could also be that the company that's willing to, to sell you the data, since they don't know how the data is being used, they charge a high price, you can't afford that. Even if you do manage to get a data set, you're also running a risk, or potentially running a risk of actually holding onto this data. If you're a smaller company, uh, you could be liable for this. If it were to leak, there could be serious consequences. Even if you do manage to get to the point where you have a very nice model, you also have to incentivize your users to actually use the model. Um, and particularly if that means that the users are exposing themselves when using the model, essentially telling the company whether or not they could have skin cancer, maybe they don't want to use the model. And then finally, you could also see what is the leakage of the model um, that you get back from the predictions. What can we learn, particularly on the, on the training data, through the predictions that we send back to the, to the customers. And then some of you, to try to mitigate this, some of you might be familiar with differential privacy. So the process of differential privacy is to add noise in the process at some point. Uh, this could be to say the training data we use has already been sanitized, so there's, nothing, there's not too much leaked from the training data. We could imagine doing something similar um, when we get in the predictions that they have also somehow been sanitized. Um, that might take care of the risk management because the company is now only operating on uh, sanitized, non-private data. Could also potentially take care of the leakage because we can now control how much of the training data has been leaked through this. It might, so here's, the, here's one of the, uh, was less, less clear. So ideally you could sanitize the, um, the prediction input in a way so that nothing is too much, not too much is leaked to the company. The question is, is then still useful? So how much would accuracy drop if you're actually doing this. And likewise, it's also not clear, this training data might be sanitized, but can we then still build accurate model that, we, uh, that can give the same services that we could before? So as a complementary to this, you can also look at secure computation. And secure computation doesn't add noise to the process. It moves the process into encrypted space. So that means that the data set we're operating on is now encrypted. The training we do, we're doing that, we continue to do that on the encrypted data without decrypting in between. And the predictions we offer at the end also happens on encrypted data instead of decrypting in between. So if we do that, then from the company's perspective, they only see encrypted data, so maybe the risk there is less. The users should also be incentivized because they're only sending encrypting data and the company doesn't know how to decrypt this. 
However, since we're taking exactly the same process as in the plain text, in the unencrypted case, and we're just moving it into the encrypted case, we're not dealing anything about leakage. So whatever leakage there were in the original model is going to be here in the encrypted model as well. But assuming we can somehow fix that, then getting access to the dating data, uh, training data could also be okay. Um, because these guys now offer only encrypted data that no one actually gets to see, or they can somehow control how this data can be used. And today I'm going to talk about more uh, secure computation. Um, so one thing you could do in, in the practice, of course, and to, to illustrate that this is complementary, is that you can make a hybrid. So you can say, uh, we're sanitizing the training data maybe at a later point, we're also using secure computation, and then potentially mitigate uh, all of these issues. All right, so moving into secure computation. Uh, today I'll talk about two techniques uh, in particular, so homomorphic encryption, secret sharing. Uh, I want to give a very quick, very rough, if you talk to a cryptographer, he will probably have a more detailed debate about this. Uh, but just a quick outline or characteristics of the two. So one could say that homomorphic encryption is very heavy on the computational side, but somewhat, uh, whereas secret sharing is somewhat light on the computational side. Where they switch is in terms of communication, so homomorphic encryption is very light, whereas secret sharing is very heavy. Uh, they both operate on, essentially on integers or on bits. Uh, but you would notice that if, when you're doing machine learning, you typically want reals or uh, floating points. What's typically done is we switch to a fixed point encoding, so we take a real and then we scale it by uh, some fixed value that ends up with an integer that we can compute on that. There's also other techniques, there's a thing called gobble circuits, uh, which uh, for the sake of argument, let's say has kind of a medium communication and, and computation complexity. The downside is here that it's often operating only on bits, meaning that you have to decompose these integers down to bits and operate at the bit level, which can add more complexity to the process, more overhead. And then finally, there's also these secure enclaves, so think Intel XTX, uh, which is light in terms of communication and, and computation. Uh, they can do any data type, they're just running the, the computation inside uh, the secure environment. But they're hardware-based, so here's a different trust assumption, where you have to trust kind of the, the hardware manufacturer and the ecosystem around this, whereas these other techniques are based on cryptography, so software-based uh, uh, guarantees through mathematics. To give you a quick overview, uh, there's been a lot of recent work here. Uh, this is just to highlight some of them over the last few years. As I said, this is just a survey, and I do suggest anyone interested go look at, at these papers. Uh, what I want to, you to pay attention to here is that there is a tendency to mix these techniques. So it's not, I don't think it's a question of just picking one and saying this is what we go with. Uh, to get the best performance, you often end up uh, picking a mix of these. All right, so to get started, I first want to look at the very simple models. We could look at, let's do linear regression, and in particular, let's do uh, prediction using linear regression. So we're going to have a model here that already has some weights W. We have a client that has some uh, new prediction input X. He wants to send this to the service and he wants to get back to the dot product. Uh, if we unravel this, then we see that the dot product, as you know, uh, is just a point by multiplication and then followed by an addition. So now if you wanted to do this using homomorphic encryption, what happens then is that our user is going to pick a decryption key that only he knows. There's also a corresponding public encryption key that everyone knows, but he's the only one that's able to decrypt. Then what he does is he sends his encryption to the service. The service can somehow still run through the prediction of the model and, and generate an encryption of the dot product and then send that back to the client who can now decrypt. If we plug that into a formula, we see that we now have on the left here, the, on, the, on the X parts, they are now encrypted. So the, the operations we have to do now involve encrypted data, ciphertext. So if we take any kind of uh, also, there are certain operations we need to do with this. And the first one we are called public multiplication. So this essentially means having a ciphertext and then having a plain text value. And now I want to move that plain text value into the encryption. So if I can do that, then I'm going to say that the encryption scheme allows me to do a public multiplication. Then we end up with these three ciphertexts and now we have to add them together. But since we're operating on ciphertext now, I'm going to call this a private addition. And if we can do these two operations, then we can generate an encryption of the dot product that we can send back to the, to the client. Now, I guess it's no surprise that if you take any ordinary encryption scheme, like AES, for instance, then we don't know how to do this. So, in particular, we need this homomorphic encryption scheme that actually satisfies these true properties that allows us to do these, these two operations. Um, but if we can do that, then we can do uh, uh, predictions using a linear model on encrypted data. Uh, so, to look at a concrete scheme, we start out with saying we actually need what's called a probabilistic encryption scheme. So, this means that the encryption is no longer just of the plain text, but also of a random value, this R component that goes into it. And to give you a quick intuition of why that's the case, so say we're doing a prediction and we're sending back a zero or one. So even without knowing the decryption key, if we didn't have this randomness component, I could try to guess, I could try to brute force. I could, using the public encryption key, I could encrypt zero, does that match with the result? 
Or I can try to encrypt one, does that match the result? And I can, I can uh, detect what's inside the, the ciphertext in this way. But if we have this randomness component, then I also have to brute force this randomness. So if there's sufficient many choices for this, then that becomes infeasible. So in other words, we have this kind of, the plain text domain is much, la much smaller than the, than the ciphertext domain. All right, so one concrete instance of a homomorphic encryption scheme that's, I guess, going on 20 years now. Uh, there's more advanced schemes out there, but this one is a bit simpler to illustrate. Uh, it's called Pallier encryption. And this is basically the definition of how you form a ciphertext using this. So it might look a bit scary if you're not from a crypto background. Um, the first thing you notice is there's now this green component as well, which is the public encryption key, consists of a G and N and N square. Uh, when, what you do when you want to make an encryption is you have two integers, G is an integer, X is this encoded fixed point, which is also an integer. So you just raise G to, to the power of X, you do the same for R with N, you multiply the two, and then you do everything mod N squared. So it's a relatively simple operation. As a quick example, let's say our G is 36, our N is 35, and N squared is, is whatever it is. If we now want to encrypt 5 using randomness 2, we plug it in and we get 718. If we want to encrypt 5 again, but using a different randomness, we see we get a different, uh, different value, of course. All right, so one note here to give some indication of why this becomes heavy in terms of computation is that in order for this equation to be secure, so in order to prevent someone from going back from the ciphertext to learn information about X or R in this case, these values typically have to be around 4,000 bits long. So it's no longer about computing on 64 bits values, it's about computing on 4,000 bit values. And that's where the computational overheads uh, comes in at least for this particular scheme. Um, all right, so coming back to our linear model, the, one of the operations we needed to do was private addition. Um, so let's say we have this encryption of X, we have an encryption of Y, let's see what happens if we multiply these two. So these are just two integers in our ring. Let's see what happens if we multiply them. We plug into a formula, we rearrange, and we end up with this, so which we just see essentially an encryption of X plus Y using randomness R times S. So in other words, if we take two ciphertexts, an encryption of X and an encryption of Y, we multiply them, we end up with a third ciphertext, which is now an encryption of X plus Y. Uh, as an example, we can take the two from before, so our two encryptions of two, we plug it in, we see it gives us an encryption of 10 using randomness eight, so five plus five using, two times, using randomness two times four. Uh, the other operation we needed to have was public multiplication, so we have a ciphertext and encryption of X, and we now have this public value uh, W. We want to move R into W, multiply them. So what happens if we raise x to the power of w? We plug into a formula, we rearrange, and we see this exactly the same as if we had done an encryption of x times w using randomness r to the power of w. And again, we can take our example, five encryption of two, raise it to two, gives us an encryption of 10. All right, so with these two operations, we can now actually do predictions using a linear model um, on encrypted data. All right, so the other technique I was talking about is called secret sharing. And secret sharing takes the key away from it, so there's no longer any private decryption key. The trust assumption here, or where the cryptography is rooted in, is that we now split the trust. We distribute the trust between these two servers. So instead of just having one prediction server now, we have two prediction servers, and they both have a copy of the model. That's the difference here. Uh, but then we don't need to have this, this decryption key. So instead of encrypting stuff, we're now generating shares of our private input here. And we're generating a share one and a share two. These have the properties that if you only know one of the shares, then you don't learn anything about X but we can still compute on it and the two servers can still arrain, ar arrive at this sharing of the dot product that they then send back to the client. Knowing both shares, he can now reconstruct and learn the dot product. All right, so let's see what this looks like. Uh, yeah, and of course, uh, same reason as before, we need this scheme to be uh, what I would call a homomorphic encryption, a homomorphic secret sharing scheme. Uh, one concrete, concrete instance of this uh, is what's used in the speech protocol. It's also called additive secret sharing. Um, they're defined in this way. We see there's still this blue component here, which is no longer a public key, it's a public parameter. So it can be fixed once and for all, and it can be chosen of any arbitrary size that fits your application. So we don't have the same expansion up to 4,000 bits. We can pick this to be 64 bits, for instance. Uh, then we see that the first share of our input is essentially just a randomness. So if this is picked independently of X, then this will obviously not leak anything about X. And then the second share is just X masked by this randomness. So again, if you don't know the first share, if you don't know R, then you don't learn anything from this. This is a uniform random value as well. But of course, if you add those two together, R cancels out and you recover X. As a quick example, if we want to secret share five using randomness seven, the first share will be seven. The second share will be five minus seven, mod 10, minus, uh, minus two, mod 10 is eight. Um, and if you add those up, you get 15, 15 mod 10 is, is five. So we can recover the value afterwards. 
So again, looking at our linear regression uh, model, um, let's say we have the two servers, let's say they already have sharings of X, the sharings of Y, and now they want to gener generate a sharing of X plus Y. So uh, they already have these two shares, turns out they can just add what they already have, so they can find a set one and a set two, which is just an addition of the values they already have. If you plug that in and rearrange, you see that set one plus set two will give you X plus uh, Y. So note this is just a local operation, there's no communication here and they're operating on small values, which essentially has the same overhead as if you're doing this in plain text. The second operation we needed was public multiplication. Again, they can just if operate on what they already have, and that if gives a set one, set two, which adds up to x times w. So we can also do predictions using a linear model in sequence sharing. So moving on to something that's a bit more advanced, let's look at convolutional neural networks, uh, coming back to our initial uh, motivation for this. Um, particularly, we're going to look at this MNIST example that was also talked about in the previous talk. So here we have a model that's more advanced, that has more weights. The user comes with an input, which is the digit. He sends the digit to the model and gives back the, uh, the, uh, what digit was in, on an, uh, an estimate of what digit was in the, was in the image. Um, I picked a very simple convolutional neural network here. It just has a few layers for feature extraction, a few layers for classification afterwards. Uh, but these techniques will scale to, to larger networks as well. Um, the first question is how do we sequence share images? Well, I guess that's kind of obvious. So an image is just an array of numbers. So we can do the same trick as before. We can generate these random looking images. We can use them to blind our initial input and then we end up with these two, two different shares uh, of, of random images. With the property again that if we, we add them, of course, then we get back the, the input. If we then look at our convolutional neural network like this, uh, the first layer is just a convolution, which essentially is just a dot product, and we just saw how, how that was done. <coughs> so in principle, we can do that. Uh, likewise, for the dense layers, that's just a, um, a dot product. We know how to do that again. Um, the dropout, so especially if you, at least if you use the simpler dropout mechanisms, this is somewhat independent of whether you're using uh, encryption or not. You just, the two servers have to agree on what values they drop, for instance, and then uh, that's fine. Then the next thing we have is activation functions and, and pulling operations. Here I picked initially the ReLU and the max pulling. It turns out these things are really expensive to do in the encrypted space. They can be done, but they're, they're more expensive than the other operations. So what's interesting is actually to replace the model with something else. So we could replace the activation functions with sigmoids, and we could replace the max pulling with average pulling. If we do that, we get, we get better overhead, or better performance. Pulling is then just an addition followed by a public multiplication, so we know how to do that already. And the activation function is, I'll come back to in a second. The key takeaway here is, ah yeah, sorry, so that leaves the softmax at the end. You could do the softmax as well, there are techniques for doing this on encrypted data. If we're just doing a prediction, it might be interesting to actually move this to the client. So instead of sending back a probability distribution, we're sending him back likelihoods. And then he can do, after he reconstructs the value, he's going to apply the softmax if he really wants this. All right, the key takeaway here is that Adapting these models to also work in the encrypted space can significantly improve performance. They can be done, you can take your existing model and move it into the encrypted space, but you can get much better performance if you're willing to adapt the model a tiny bit. And that's kind of where the, so, so far it's been about the, the cryptography of this, of optimizing the cryptography, but now it starts to be about the machine owners also optimizing the models for the encrypted space. All right, so coming back to the sigmoid, uh, just briefly, so it might look, um, Remember we were replacing a ReLU with this, which might look much worse because now we're doing a division with a private value. We do an exponentiation with a private value. It turns out uh, a typical trick that's done is to actually use these polynomial approximations for the sigmoid. So if we know that the input stays within an interval, so say minus five and five, then we can interpolate a polynomial that's sufficiently accurate in that interval um, and use that instead of the, of the sigmoid. So if we do that, then we're down to evaluating this polynomial. Uh, multiplying with the coefficients is the public multiplications we already had. Adding up the terms afterwards is the private addition we already have. So the only thing we're missing now is how do we get these powers of x, uh, which essentially is a private multiplication. And if we use the Pellier encryption scheme that I had before for the homomorphic encryption scheme, we don't actually know how to do private multiplication as such using that scheme. But some of the more recent schemes will also allow you to do this. So that's when it starts to become full homomorphic encryption that I'm not talking about today. Uh, but it can be done. But coming back to speeds, how it's done here if we're secret sharing the values is we have our x and y again, and now we want to define the set, which is x times y. It turns out in order to do that, we need some form of communication. So this is where it starts to be expensive. Before it was just local operations, now we need to have some kind of communication between the two servers. And the way it's done in some protocols uh, is to use these random triples that come up front. So these are just two random values, a and b, which has already been secret shared between the two servers, and then a c, which is a product of a and b. And we also, the two servers also have shares of this. 
Using these values, we can now define an alpha and a beta, which essentially is a, is a blinding of x and y. And we can use these values into a combination phase where we arrive at a set one and a set two that adds up to x times y. So I don't want to go too much into the details. They're all on the slides. You're interested if, you, uh, if you're interested, you can look. Um, the key takeaway here is that we now, to do private multiplications, we need to have some kind of interaction. So we need to have some kind of communication that carries an overhead. And we also need to have these triples up front. Um, however, they're independent of the actual value. So they're typically moved to what's called an offline phase and generated before we're actually running the offline phase where we know the data, or the secret shared data. Okay, but if we can do that, then we could essentially do uh, private predictions um, using unencrypted data, uh, using, using secret sharing. Um, there's a lot of optimizations I haven't looked at here, uh, but we're more than happy to have the discussion offline. This was just to give an intuition of how you can do that. Um, also wanted to mention a bit about training. Um, I'm not going to go into details in, in, uh, in the, uh, for the sake of, of time, um, but there's definitely some interesting challenges there. Uh, just to, to set it up a bit, um, so let's say we have these dermatologists and to understand who are the participants. Uh, what would typically happen is that we now have two servers. They're not offering a prediction service, but they're offering a training service. Then each participant would come along and would, would secret share his training data and send it to the two servers. And then once the data is there in secret shared form, we can start to do this training process. Um, this could also be a process that happens among the, the, the specialists in this case without actually having the two servers. So when you have to pick these two servers, uh, there's the question of who actually runs them. Is it two different companies? Is it a company and a union of the dermatologists? Is it between the dermatologists themselves and so on? That's one of the questions you have to answer when, you, when you're looking at secret sharing and, and MPC in general. Um, so, okay, so moving on to the more technical aspects. Um, the softmax, we, before we moved it to the client, during training we can't do that because we need to actually evaluate the softmax. What's typically done in literature is to replace it with something simpler. So I just told you the ReLU. It's expensive. It turns out it's cheaper to do the ReLU than doing the normal softmax. So this is what people would, would typically do. Uh, and they can achieve good accuracy with this as well. Um, you would also be tempted to use more advanced optimization strategies like RMS prop, uh, ADA, and so on. This component underneath here, where we're doing uh, division with a square root, is very expensive. So we would like to skip that, especially if that depends on, on private values, which the weights would be in this case. And what you typically see in literature is to people fall down to the normal stochastic uh, gradient descent. Uh, but finding the good optimization strategy here is also, is also interesting. Um, slightly different is, in order to get good performance from this, um, you would shoot yourself in the foot if you move everything into the encrypted space. And it's int more interesting to look at how can we take something in the public space and then uh, only do certain operations in the encrypted space. And one ideal application for that could be transfer learning where we're saying that if you were to train a convolutional neural network, you don't want to take, uh, to start doing that from scratch. So you might, uh, if on the encrypted data, you might start out with a public data set, train as much as you can to improve the performance on that, fix some of the layers, and then only do fine tuning um, afterwards in the encrypted space. So here, for instance, involve the, the dermatologist later in the process. Uh, that's some of the techniques we, we see in literature. Um, moving on to uh, the final part which is about making this accessible. So before saying anything about that, uh, let me point out that there's already very excellent projects and literature out there. Uh, here's a collection of the papers from before. I do encourage you to, to go have a look if you're interested. Uh, there's also very good general purpose software computation or secure computation frameworks out there. Uh, just mention a few here uh, with a, a reference list for where they keep track of, of the latest. Um, however, they are, as I said, more general purpose computation where you're, you're interested in doing any, any computation at all. And I do think there's room for these more specialized projects. So that's the one I'll be talking about now. Uh, one called TF Encrypted, which is trying to put some of this stuff directly into TensorFlow. And the other one called PySift, which is trying to do the same for uh, PyTorch instead. All right. And one of the main motivations behind this is that it's very much a cross-disciplinary field in the sense that we have all this cryptography on one side about the techniques we saw so we can mix garbled circuits, homomorphic encryption, secret sharing, and so on. Uh, we also have various protocols for optimizing the operations. So instead of, for instance, if you want to do the ReLU, you can have specialized protocols that are better than, um, than doing it in somewhat in a naive way. Uh, and you also have these different questions around guarantee. Who are the parties? Uh, what cryptography is used underneath? And so on. On the other hand, you also have all this machine learning. So how do you adapt the models to give better performance? So this is where approximations might come in. There's also a question of accuracy. How much precision do we need to have in the numbers? Can we quantify values to save on this? 
But then there's also the question of engineering. So when we're building these systems, we are now talking about distributed protocols. So you do need to send stuff uh, across on the, on the network. Uh, you need to take advantage of multi-core architectures whenever they're available. Uh, and there's also, from a more software perspective, of writing code that's actually easy to maintain. So if you have a cryptographer coming in wanting to contribute on, on that level, uh, it should be easy to read the code and, and not have to go too much, likewise for the machine learning perspective. And then finally, there's also the data science aspect of this. So by use cases, I mean finding use cases which are constrained, or which, is, which is working under the constraints of the current state of the art in secure computation. There's also the question of how does this fit into the workflow of a normal data scientist that might be used to, be, to being able to expect the data, to play around with it. What happens when all of that uh, happens on private data that it doesn't have access to? And then finally, when you put stuff in deployment, how do you monitor that this is okay? How do you s to make sure that the drift of your model uh, is controlled and so on? So there's all these kind of knowledge that goes into actually building these systems and making them, them scalable. And for that reason, uh, one key takeaway here is that I think it's useful to have a common framework uh, in which to, work, to, to do this, this work, uh, and essentially a common language to talk about these things. And that's exactly the purpose of TF Encrypted. So TF Encrypted, as, as ben, Benny was also saying, is an open source project for exploring, experimenting with these stuff directly in TensorFlow. Um, TensorFlow, for, you, those, for those of you that don't know it, uh, is a platform for doing production level training and deployment of models that's somewhat popular uh, and backed by Google. Uh, it works by generating these data flow graphs underneath, so you specify your computation, your machine learning process as a data flow graph, and then you hand that off to a distributed backend that takes care of, of executing these models. Uh, that backend is highly optimized, so when you're doing, it's typically used for doing distributed training. And Google is putting a lot of resources into actually making that efficient. So without much work, um, you get concurrent behavior. They will try to take some of these operations and actually run them on multiple, uh, multiple architectures. Uh, and they'll also try to optimize the networking. So instead of sending two small packages, they will figure out, based on the data flow graph, that we can send one package instead if we move around the computation a bit. Uh, what we see here, for instance, is that this was without us doing much optimization. Um, TensorFlow was already taking advantage of the multi-core architecture. And also figuring out that all these triples I was talking about could essentially be batched and moved up to this offline phase. So it's not a strict offline phase in the, in the typical sense in cryptography, but we see that it is doing it up front instead of it doing it uh, during the computation because it, it applied some heuristics based on the network characteristics that said this was more efficient. Um, but also there is the question of how to make this usable, how to make this easy to approach from, especially if you come from a non-cryptographic background. So uh, first I'll show a script doing this, doing a simple prediction using ordinary TensorFlow, where we can imagine we have a model owner here on the left that owns the model, and we have a client on the right again, the prediction client that has an input, and now he wants to, to run a prediction on, on this model. If you were to express this in TensorFlow, it would be somewhat implicit uh, where the data is coming from, but you could write it like this. So we have three functions here which are just used for, for instance, for loading the, the network from disk, loading the prediction input, and then from the final output, uh, we're just taking the ArcMax and then we're printing it on the screen. Then we define our model here, so we, we get our inputs, we define the, the, the two hidden layers we have, um, and we define the operation we have to run to actually get, get the final output. And then we run this using the, the TensorFlow engine. And then this was, so anyone with basic familiarity with TensorFlow should recognize uh, more or less how these scripts work. If you now want to do this on private prediction instead, so on private data using TF Encrypted, the model changes a bit because we now have these two servers that we saw from before, where the model owner is now sending shares of the weights to the two servers, and the prediction client is doing the same for his, his input. So notice here we're also keeping the model private. And then this is what the script looks like in, in TensorFlow. And now, as you can see, it's very similar to the one before, and I'll now try to I'll highlight the, the differences. So one is, we're now importing TF Encrypted right next to TensorFlow because we're not trying to replace TensorFlow, we're trying to build on top of it. So this essentially is, a, you can see there's a little compiler that helps build these data flow graphs working on encrypted data. Then the function remains the same, the model remains the same. The next difference instead is, instead of now calling provide weights directly, we're now annotating and saying this has to be a private uh, input and it has to be run on the machine belonging to the model owner. So what this does is, it it executes this function, provide, in, provide weights, on the machine belonging to the model owner. When he's done with that, so all that happens using ordinary TensorFlow in plain text, when that's done, uh, when we have the weights, um, we're taking care of secret sharing it and then actually sending it to the two servers. So at this point, the, the weights we use, the W and the Bs, uh, exist in secret share form and are now private values instead. 
Likewise, on the prediction client, we're now saying that instead of calling provide input and receive output directly, this has to now be done on the prediction client who can do any type of pre-processing, uh, feature extracting and so on using ordinary TensorFlow. Once that's done, uh, we take care of actually secret sharing the input. So the X we have here now is now a private value that's been secret shared. We run it through the model. When we have the result at the bottom, instead of calling receive output directly on the logics, we're now saying again, this has to happen on the prediction client. So we send, at this point, the two servers arrive at a secret share of, of, of X, oh, sorry, of the, um, of the logics. And then now we're taking care of this call to actually send them to the prediction client, the machine of the prediction client, do the reconstruction there, and then calling receive output on that function uh, in this case, which amounts to doing the ArcMax and printing it on the screen. But that's it, that's the, that's the only difference in the script. Um, and I do think this is somehow inherent. So when you, when you move from the public uh, case to the private case, uh, the thing you do have to worry about or do have to, to make up your mind on is who actually gets to see which values uh, in plain text and at what point uh, does value exist in the, only in the encrypted space. And that's kind of what we're highlighting with, in this script. All right, so that brings me to the wrap up. Um, just the main takeaway is so I do see these privacy preserving technologies as not necessarily replacing what we already have, but enabling new use cases. Um, for instance, when we start operating on sensitive data. Uh, I also see some secure computation as being complementary to what we already have and not a replacement of it. So, as a machine learning uh, engineer, you could see it as another computational device instead of seeing it as essentially the equivalent of a CPU or a GPU. Uh, and you want to definitely mix it with potentially differential privacy, but also with other techniques like transfer learning, as we saw. Uh, it is very much a cross-disciplinary field, uh, which benefits from adaptations from, from all sides. And for this, we believe it's important to have this, this kind of common framework, common language. And then finally, as a bonus, there's also been some interest in this uh, from the safety community inside machine learning, where it's about model governance. How do you share uh, control of a model once it's, it's been trained, for instance? Uh, but also in fairness, like how do you validate a model if uh, someone wants, doesn't want to tell you what the, what the model looks like, but also doesn't want to tell you what data is being evaluated on. And with that, I'll say thank you.